morning, everybody. Um, I am uh, Professor Frank Shovlin of the Institute of Irish Studies at the University of Liverpool, and I'm delighted to be here this morning to welcome you to the Liverpool Literary Festival. Following on from the great success of our previous festivals, we're delighted to welcome more internationally renowned writers to the city. The festival's main sponsors are Student Roost and Bruntwood, and we're very grateful for their support. At the end of this event, please wait for our speaker to leave the hall before you do, so that she can get downstairs to the Blackwells Festival bookstall. There you can buy her books, which she'll be delighted to sign. I will leave time after this reading and discussion for audience questions, but please wait for microphones so everyone can hear you. So this morning, I am delighted to be introducing Louise Kennedy. Louise is the winner of our John McGahern Prize for debut book of Irish fiction, published in 2021 for her superb collection of short stories, The End of the World is a Cul-de-Sac, published by Bloomsbury. Louise grew up in County Down and now lives in County Sligo. She has written for The Guardian, Irish Times, BBC Radio 4, and RTE Radio 1. She was shortlisted for the Sunday Times Audible Short Story Award in both 2019 and 2020. Before starting her writing career, she spent nearly 30 years working as a chef. Now in its third year, the John McGarhan Prize was established by the Institute of Irish Studies to promote new Irish fiction and to celebrate the memory of John McGarhan, 1934 to 2006, one of Ireland's greatest masters of prose fiction. The prize, which is worth 5,000 pounds, has previously been awarded to Hilary Fannin for The Weight of Love in 2020, and to Adrian Duncan for Love Notes from a German Building Site in 2019, and has grown each year since its inauguration with 24 entries for the 2021 prize. The End of the World is a cul-de-sac is a worthy winner of the prize, a remarkably achieved collection of 15 short stories. One of these stories, What the Birds Heard, happens to mention the writer for whom this prize is named when we are told that the central character quote, had bought a litre bottle of powers when she moved in, imagining her neighbours calling in for a drink as if they were all characters in a John McGahern book. This is typical of the kind of nicely observed image with which the book abounds, and reminds me of a line from one of Chekhov's letters of which John McGahern was particularly fond. In descriptions of nature, one must seize on small details, grouping them so that when the reader closes his eyes, he gets a picture. For instance, you'll have a moonlit night if you write that on the mill dam a piece of glass from a broken bottle glittered like a bright little star, and that the black shadow of a dog or a wolf rolled past like a ball. Whether it is Stacy Rainey's too small Letterkenny IT Gaelic football jersey in the story in Bullock, or the rusting Christmas lights beside the super value of hunter-gatherers, Louise has a startling ability to pick just the right image to allow us into the world of 21st century Ireland, its peculiar melancholic cycles of boom and bust economics. And with that, like all good writers, forces the reader to look at themselves with fresh eyes. Louise. <coughs> Thank you, Frank, for that uh, lovely uh, introduction, and uh, it's very nice to be in Liverpool, and um, it's a huge honour uh, to be awarded um, a prize, um, and it's kind of astounding to be, for my name to be mentioned in the same breath as John McGarren, so I'm thrilled. Um, so I'm going to read a bit from uh, the stories, so um, I might read from, I'm, I'm going to read the first page of the, oh, the title story, um, The End of the World is a, a, is a Cul-de-Sac, because I like reading that. The dereliction was almost beautiful, the houses dark against the mauve dawn, pools of buff-coloured water glinting briefly as a passing car took the last bend before town. Number seven was starting to look like the other units, the lawn stringy with brown weeds. The footpath petered out and Sarah landed hard in a puddle, picking her way over broken masonry and loops of cable until she reached the end of the cul-de-sac. The noise was coming from the show house, 
It looked even worse inside than out. Clots of dung littered the travertine floor. All the doors had been taken, including the front one, which only seemed to emphasize how small the rooms were. The donkey was in the living room by the cavity in the chimney breast where the granite fireplace had been. It was plump and skittish, pastilles of dried sleep in the corners of its eyes. Sarah whispered to it, cajoled, pleaded. She tried shooing it, spreading her arms to drive it out into the hallway. It pawed and snattered, and a flume of shit hit the wall behind it. She'd have to go and get her neighbour. She left the estate and started up the steep lane towards Matty Feeney's house. She'd gone there once with Davy when the old man's wife died. Away from the main road, the light was different. It was hard to see. The brambles that coiled back over the dry stone walls nicked her hands. She walked faster, almost trotting, her wellingtons kicking up small rocks and squeaking over the tranche of grass that ran the centre of the lane. She was breathing hard when she reached the yard. A light was on in the stables. Someone was mucking out, metal tines scraping the ground. The raking stopped. She didn't hear footsteps until they were very close. Um, I'm going to read a little bit then from a uh, the story that um, Frank mentioned there called uh, In Bullock. And um, it's set on St. Bridget's Day, which is the 1st of February, which is supposed to be um, the first day of spring in Ireland. And uh, usually, the I think really spring in Ireland must be about daylight or something because the weather's usually dreadful. Um, so it doesn't feel spring at all. And in this story, um, uh, it's snowing and um, the, the, lamin, the, the lamin is in kind of full, uh, full tilt. Um, um, so it's about a, 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 a youngish couple. Um, uh, Elaine is um, is pregnant and um, and has a has a baby already, and um, her husband is in the uh, lambing shed with an unhelpfully glamorous nineteen year old. Elaine hauled Grace out of her cot and slung her onto her hip. The other baby, the one in her belly, she was carrying low, and there wasn't much room. She went along the hall. Liam had put turf in the range before he left for the lambing shed, and the kitchen was warm and quiet. She squashed Grace into her high chair and put on a pan of milk for their breakfast. She stood at the sink and looked up at the hill farm. They still called it that, even though Liam's father had lost the rest of the farm, the good land further down the mountain where he'd once kept a dairy herd. They just had sheep now. A few of them were dotted around the fields, their coats grubby against the snow. It had begun to fall late the previous evening, and Liam had been out for most of the night bringing in the ewes. The ruined byre where they stored the turf was now a rounded knoll, and the hedges and stone walls were fringed white. Only the lambing shed was bare, snowflakes melting on contact with the roof, trickling down the green corrugated ridges. Around the edge of the structure was a grey-brown slush. She heard the engine before she saw the car, if you'd call it a car a four by four, high off the ground and glossy black, its rear portion long with tinted windows, a hearse on steroids. It crunched to a halt in the yard, leaving thick bluish tracks in its wake. Liam came out of the shed, wiping his hands on his arse. He stood back and watched the brother and sister get out. Trevor Rainey, his humped shoulders putting 10 years on him, his nose and mouth wrapped in a scarf to keep the weather from his bad lungs. Stacy Rainey and leopard print Wellingtons twisting her auburn hair into a messy bun. When Liam had said he was taking uh, Trevor's sister on as an agricultural science placement student, Elaine had thought he meant the other girl, the one with the stumpy legs and a squint. They followed Liam into the shed. Elaine put four Weetabix into a pasta bowl and doused it in hot milk. She sat at the table to share it with Grace. One for you, one for me, she told the child, but Grace was hungry, and after a couple of mouthfuls, Elaine amended it to two for you, one for me. Grace hadn't swallowed the last spoonful when she seized the tray of the high chair with both hands, evacuating her bowels, her face a picture of both horror and bliss. Elaine dropped the bowl and spoon in the sink and brought Grace to the bedroom. She lay her on the bed to change her. There seemed to be more shite than child. She wrapped the soiled nappy tightly, resealing the adhesive strips and pitched it across the room with the bin. It landed safely. Yes, she said, and punched the air. Grace clapped. 
Elaine sat Grace in the shower tray where she slapped at shampoo suds. A bath would have eased Elaine's backache, but lately it appalled her to see the new baby heave from one side to another, to feel the tiny heels and hands jab between her ribs. Elaine dried Grace first, taking care with the folds of her knees and thighs and neck, and blew a raspberry on her tummy. She dressed her and put her in the cot while she got herself ready. A couple of months earlier, the bath sheet had wrapped all the way around her. Now her bare belly ballooned from it. She was colossal. In the sallow gloom of the energy saver bulb, her nipples were like cigar butts. Sorry, I didn't intend to read this, but anyway, I better keep going. <coughs> Sorry. Um, new stretch marks made, it, uh, made a violet lacy pattern on either side of her diaphragm. The line that ran from her bulging navel to her unkempt pubic hair that she rarely saw made her look as though she'd been marked for dissection. She snapped the straps of her brow up to her collarbone and rubbed wheat germ oil into her itchy skin. She pulled on maternity leggings, one of Liam's shirts, and Gryffindor striped knee socks bought long before a shopping trip meant standing in the baby clothes section of pennies, trying to remember what she'd gone in for. There was more hair in her hairbrush than in her fringe, and she spat coral-coloured froth when she brushed her teeth. A midwife at the clinic had told her she should have given herself more time before planning another baby. There'd be no plan, just enough Pinot Grigio to help her overlook the resemblance that Liam's cock bore to Grace's arm. In the kitchen, she put Grace in her playpen and resumed her watch at the window. Snow was still falling. The shed door opened and Liam came out with Trevor Rainey. They gripped hands as if they were about to arm wrestle, a gangster gesture that filled her with shame for her husband and for herself. She made tea and sat at the table to drink it. If the weather hadn't turned, she would have driven towards town, picked up biscuits and crisps for them to snack on in the shed, called in on Siobhan, her sister, although Elaine found the lodge depressing with its smell of lush, of, of um, hash, sorry, hash and mildew, the mad talk out of Sid as if he was living on the edge of a vast frontier. For want of something better to do, she stripped the bed and bunged the linen in the machine to wash. At 11, she dressed Grace in her pink pram suit and put on one of Liam's coats, stepping into her Wellingtons at the back door. She went up the lane slowly, her boots leaving deep, deliberate prints. Grace had tilted her head back and was flicking her tongue out, catching snowflakes. The shed was warm, the air fetid with damp wool and blood and sheep droppings. There were ewes crammed into the pig pen, pawing and fretting, heavy belly skimming the floor. In the small pens, the new mothers were nuzzling and lapping at their newborns. Stacy Rainey was filling a bucket of water at the sink by the wall, dressed in a Letterkenny IT Gaelic football jersey that was a size too small, and black, wet-look jeggings. She put the bucket in one of the pens and came to a lane. She tickled Grace under the chin, and the child's mouth uh, gaped open, a slobbery, happy smile. The wee treasure, thought Elaine. Where's Liam, she said. Stacy inclined her head at the far wall. He's watering. We're afraid the pipes will freeze. We're afraid, the cheek of her. When are you back to college, said Elaine. Monday week. Great, said Elaine. A panel in the false wall slid aside. For a moment, Elaine glimpsed the rows and rows of plants, the cables and lamps that were strung across the ceiling, their eerie light. Liam banged the panel shut and crossed the floor to her, his feet kicking up the lime slake straw. Stay in the house, I told you, he said. I'm bored. I don't want Grace breathing in this shit. He kissed his daughter on the forehead. What time will you be down for lunch, said Elaine. Half twelve. She put Grace on her other, on her other hip. As she passed the big pen, a ewe moaned a dreadful sound. She called out to Liam to tell him the animal seemed ready, but his back was to her. He was standing with his legs wide apart, talking down to Stacey Rainey, who was crouching on the floor, bottle feeding a lamb through the bars of one of the pens. Her haunches in the leggings were full and shiny. That one's a tramp, she whispered to Grace as they went through the doors of the yard. The clouds were low and pinkish. The gritter hadn't made it, and beyond the lower fields, the road was a lethal grey ribbon. Thanks very much, uh, Louise. Um, Sorry, that was probably a bit rude. I don't know what page I thought I was reading. 
Mm. You know, I thought it, g it gave a very good flavor of, of the kinds of stories that, that are in the book. Um, one of the things about the book is that, and both those stories had touches of it, it that almost all of the relationships between men and women are disastrous. Um, and it, you, you follow this up with a novel now, Trespasses, which is very different in that the, the, there's a relationship which is largely happy. Um, was it your intention with the end of the world, is a cul-de-sac, to write a book about the failure of men and women's relationships? Um, no, it wasn't really, but um, I do guess now that I probably did write 15 stories about shit relationships. But um, uh, No, I think um, I just started, I think with every idea that I had, um, Maybe it was because the first story that I wrote in the collection, um, although I didn't know it was going to be a collection, just the first story I wrote that's in here uh, is Hunter Gatherers. And I think maybe um, I found in, like, even in the very first draft, um, that I hit a tone that I thought was maybe working in, in a way that, um, that was, um, I don't know, that it just seemed to be getting me deeper into the story than, uh, than other things that I tried before. And I just tried to keep that in mind. And I, I suppose because, um, each idea that I had at that time for a story um, seemed to be very much in the place that I lived in, which is the, the northwest of Ireland, which is pretty, I mean, um, it's really beautiful, but it's also um, kind of depressed in some ways. Um, we were talking about this earlier, about so many towns that are just dying or dead, and there's no infrastructure, no jobs, no public transport, and um, you know, there are sort of nice places, and you know, population centres and stuff, where, where people could possibly live, um, but in other places it's pretty desolate. And um, at the time that I was writing the stories, I was spending a lot of time driving from um, where I live in Sligo to uh, Queen's University in Belfast, and that route was taking me through very rural parts of Sligo, Leitrim, West Cavan, and, and uh, through the border, where, where it's really particularly noticeable um, th that these places are, are failing. And um, I had the radio on in the car a lot, and um, I, I suppose um, a, lo a lot of the uh, time, it, it was like, you know, I would go to, between stations, depending on where I was, it would switch at the border, and, and um, there was yet another debate, I suppose, about women's reproduction rights in the lead up to um, repeal, and, um, and then there were more revelations about mother and baby homes, and then when I got to the north, they were um, very often talking about maybe looking for the disappeared or the troubles. So I think all of those things were in there. Um, and then, I mean, I wasn't trying to do anything overtly political. And I suppose that, uh, you know, maybe the ideas for stories were just about, I don't know, the people. And um, and I guess once I put them in re relationships, um, yeah, and, and with all of um, with all of those factors kind of uh, pressing on them, that maybe the relationships don't have a lot of chance when people are mm -hmm. struggling. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think one of the strengths of the book is that it, it gives a very accurate picture of modern Ireland. Um, so it's John McGarren, for instance, it's, it's, it's people call around to the house and drink powers, like you talked about in that story, whereas here people are, um, they've set up grow houses for cannabis, they take cocaine recreationally. Um, do you think Ireland is, is, at, is at an unusual moment where those two cultures are intersecting. The older culture of the John McGarren world, mm -hmm. shall we say, mm -hmm. and the newer culture of uh, a kind of a kind of desperate kind of hedonism around drug use and, and, and the kind of dereliction that you've just described. Yeah, I think it's I think it is definitely. Um, for about for a couple of years I worked in a, a public library in South Sligo and a town called Tubber Curry, which would be one of those kind of struggling um, towns. It's where um, um, a, a lot of um, normal people uh, was filmed, which is probably the most exciting thing that's ever happened there. Um, um, when when all of those big trucks moved into the town and everybody was trying to borrow normal people from the library uh, that I worked in. But um, uh, I think, sorry, I, I was oh, oh, oh yeah, so, so when I was in there, so uh, we used to get the local papers in there, so this was a big thing. So we'd get in a few copies of the local papers and because it was on the Sligo Mayo border, um, uh, we'd have, you know, the Sligo Champion, the Sligo Weekend, the Mayo people and stuff. And uh, the, the, the papers used to really baffle me. So the front page might co uh, cover, it might carry a photograph of, um, of uh, lots of people, mostly elderly people, um, attending a novena in a, in a church somewhere. And then underneath it, there'd be a picture of a, a, 
of a few guards pointing up at the roof of a, of a mouldering bungalow out of Bog Road somewhere, um, where they just found like insane amounts of drugs. Um, and all of those things are, are really, um, you know, there and, and very much side by side. So, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I see exactly the same in, in the provincial newspapers mm. when I go home. And those, that, that's a very odd mix of a kind of modernity with, yeah. with tradition. Um, I mentioned that uh, you followed this with a novel um, called Trespasses, which is set during the Troubles. And I wondered if you would, this is, a, this is the first book of short stories to win this prize. The previous two winners have been novels. If you would talk a little bit about the differences bet between writing a short story or a collection of short stories and a novel. And, and do you have a is, there a, is there a form you feel more comfortable with? Um. I, I think, so I, I didn't write until I was, um, I was, it was like 2014 and I was kind of, I, I told the story loads of times, but I, was, I, I wasn't quite bundled into a car, but not far off, was to go to a writing group in January 2014. Um, and um, I think the short story, um, I mean, I think it's the natural unit of fiction for like MA, creative writing MAs um, and, and workshops. So um, in the writing group that, when I went, that, that I went to that first night, it was agreed that we'd each try and, uh, we'd, somebody would submit a short story every week and there was kind of a road and drawn up and I had five weeks to try and write a story. And um, I think then I just kept writing stories and trying to get better at them. And, um, and I think, you know, with anything that you do, you do kind of get better at doing things with, with practice. Um, so, I mean, I've probably written about 50 stories, but there are 15 in that. You know, the others, uh, God forbid that anybody's ever see a lot of them. Um, and um, uh, the, so, I, d I don't know. I, th I think then it, it got to a stage where um, I think the final story in, um, in, in this book is Garland Sunday. And um, it's the longest story. Um, it, it wound up at 9,000 words, but at one point it was up at around 30,000. And um, there are two fairly distinctive story threads. So it's about, um, a, a, I suppose, an unwanted pregnancy and, and the fallout from that in the present day. Um, and then this woman's story is, is sort of twisted a bit with the story of, um, um, of another woman who's had an unwanted pregnancy, I suppose, in a time when women had much fewer uh, choices, maybe 30, 40 years beforehand. And um, I, I probably worked on that story for around 13 months, and really I should have packed it in because it nearly drove me out of my mind. But the more I wrote and the more time I spent at it, um, the less I could bear to park it. And I did manage to bring it to a point where it's finished, but actually I think what the problem with it was that um, it should have been a novel. I was trying to, to stuff a, a novel into a, a short story. Um, so I, I think that maybe the, the ideas I, I was having were becoming too big for the, the short form. Mm. So why why didn't you let it be a novel? I I didn't think it. I try. What was I writing a novel? Like I was writing short <laughs> stories. Do you know what I mean? I was just like writing short. I was like I'm a short story writer. I didn't even know. I wouldn't even have said that. I just thought, okay, I just write these things that are like stories. I don't write novels. Yeah. It just wouldn't enter my head to write a novel. Yeah. Yeah. And do you? I mean, your 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 rise has been, you know, very meteoric. Um, you know, this this is your first book. Then Trespasses comes out. Trespasses is on BBC Book at Bedtime. Um, do you have the head spins? I mean, do you, do you find it hard to describe yourself as a writer? Um, well, I mean, I have to. Like, people, do you know what I mean? I can't. I think at this stage, like, I don't know. I, like, I, 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 can't, I, I can't be going around saying I'm not really a writer if I have two books. So, and then also, like, uh, I think people just get annoyed. They don't really want to hear me being all like, you know, self-effacing and everything, even though it is completely mortifying and stuff, and I don't know what I'm doing, but, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I don't know if that even answers your question. It does, it does. Yeah, sorry. Um, your, your 30 years as, as a chef, um, do, you, do you think that that was a, a good preparation for writing? I think in some ways it was in that, um, with, with uh, chef and you're working horrendous hours and um, anti-social hours and most of the time, like you don't, you very rarely walk in. Well, I certainly towards the end, I wasn't walking in at two or three o'clock on a Saturday going, yay, I'm at work. Well, I had like a fil filthy house with like filthy naked children running around the place. I'm only joking, they weren't really that bad. But you know what I mean? Like towards the end, it was pretty awful. And, um, but, but tough shit. So you just have to turn up and, uh, and do the work. And a lot of it is prep. Um, you know, hours and hours of standing, prepping, and then um, service comes, and 
you just have to um, yeah, brace yourself and, um, uh, and and make sure the food goes out. And I think that maybe that was good training in that, um, you know, especially when I've had to work with uh, with deadlines, like when I finished a PhD and stuff, when, um, you know that intention, we had this intention to submit thing that we had, it was nearly like a trigger in Article 47 or something. Yeah. So the same equivalent, it was like, so it did that thing, it was trying to be grand. And then it's like, oh Jesus, there's no going back. And I, I'm like 15,000 words short here or something. But anyway, yeah. um, so so for all of that kind of thing and for uh, deadlines with um, with drafts and stuff, I, I mean, it's probably really good training. So it's just, uh, yeah, just get up and do the work. And whether you feel like it. Were, were you always uh, a big reader through those years? I was a mad reader since I was about three, yeah. Mm. yeah. All sorts of reading? All uh, yeah, fiction. all sorts of reading because um, I, my children are, what are they now, 22 and 19, but um, when they were very small, I couldn't read fiction. I, I think maybe, um, I think maybe uh, I couldn't give myself uh, permission to, uh, you have to suspend your disbelief and suspend everything that's going on to, you know, throw yourself into fiction and lose yourself a bit. And I think I just, things were a bit too real and I couldn't really do that. So I only read nonfiction probably for about 10 years. And that was like anything, I read biographies and I read books about gardening and food and wine. And I got obsessed with the Mitford sisters for about three years and read everything I could get my hands on. Um, I have to say Jessica's my favorite, just want to say that. <laughs> um, how do you write now? Do you? Do you have a very strict t time of the day that you write, or is there a particular room that you write in, or, or do you sort of write on the run? Um, okay, so I'm having to do things on the run because I'm kind of going about the place a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a notebook in my handbag that I'm handwriting things into, which is, um, it's kind of great because you can't go back, but it's also not great because I can't read my own writing, so I don't know how I think that's going to work mm -hmm. when I'm, I, I go back to try and type it up. But I think it's because I've started a novel, and. I want to try and stay in it. So even if I can get a couple of pages handwritten a day, then I'm, I'm not mm. leaving it. Mm. Because sometimes if you have to go away from things for too long, you go back and it's like it's like starting afresh. You have to just start again or something. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I, th I don't know if I'm any more productive now than I was when I was like full time doing a PhD in Queens and, you know, working in a library mm. and stuff. I, I don't think I'm... Because then I used to just, I don't sleep very well, and now I just like lie in bed and think, oh, I'm not sleeping. Mm -hmm. Whereas before I'd think, okay, I'd get up and work, you know, so I'd be up at half four or five in the morning before mm -hmm. anybody came down annoying me for cereal and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, so, uh, I, oh yeah, and also I have a shed in my garden, which sounds incredible, uh, and it is great. Um, we, we didn't build it. The people who owned um, our house before us, um, the woman was, I don't know, one of those people who put your back back in when you put it out. I don't know what it is. She's not a, she wasn't a chiropractor, but anyway, she had converted this out shed in the garden into a clinic. So um, I work out there, except that at this time of year, mice get in and um, I haven't vacuumed it for a couple of months. So they're like, it's like a woodlouse graveyard as well, which is a bit horrifying. So I haven't been out there much. Um, yeah. 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 Um, I, I just need to wise up and go and clean it up a bit. I, I suspect there are a number of people here who write themselves or who have ambitions to write and be published. And I wondered if you'd say a little bit about how the, the process whereby you go from being dragged along to a writing group in 2014 to being published by Bloomsbury in, t in 2021. How, how does that happen? What were the nuts and bolts of that? Um, I, I think a lot of it was luck, but it isn't just luck because I think I was very lucky in that um, the writing group that I uh, joined, everybody in it was like really serious, and, or, or maybe it was that the people who weren't really serious fell away very quickly, and it just left um, six or seven of us who were, um, um, like, I just, you, you know you'd expect that if there's, when it was agreed in the beginning that somebody had submitted a story every week, that at some point somebody wouldn't, wouldn't do it, and no matter what was going on in anybody's life, they always submit it. So I think that was really great. It meant that um, that every two months you're producing a new story. Um, we were all recommending reading to each other. Um, I think that was um, hugely important. And then there was um, there's, there was one woman in the group, Nora McGillan, who's a poet, and um, she'd been published fairly widely. And she encouraged all of us to enter competitions and stuff. And I think that really helps. Um, I also, um, I think the, the level of feedback that we gave each other was, was important in that um, it was fairly rigorous, but also kind. So you never came away feeling that, um, feeling that 
your work was shit or you were shit. And, you know, do you know what I mean? Um, so it, it was always encouraging, even though, um, you know, people would really quite happy to tell you if, if, there, were, if there were problems with, with things. And um, so I think that really helps. Um, so I kept, I suppose I, kept, I submitted to competitions mostly at, at the start. And I had um, a couple of stories that won things and um, maybe the year I started, maybe later that year or early the next year. And that was very encouraging. Um, but then something else happened, which was that um, I think because I'd won like three things in a row in a short space of time, I thought, I am fucking brilliant at this. <laughs> <laughs> so I started to just lob things out left, right and centre. And they weren't finished and they weren't ready. And then nobody took anything off me for about six months, which is totally my own fault. And I think then I realised that, um, that it, it didn't mean that I didn't have to do the work anymore. So uh, that was probably very helpful. And um, and then, um, so after the competitions, um, I started trying to submit to journals. So I had a couple of stories in Sting and Fly, and then I had one story that was published um, in a Belfast-based journal called The Tangerine, um, which somehow ended up on the desk of an agent in London. Um, and then that story was shortlisted for the Sunday Times Short Story Award, which then, by that stage, I had maybe 10,000 words and a kind of synopsis, a one-page synopsis of a novel. So that's what my agent sold. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I think, like I did actually submit to a, a couple of agents and um, um, both of them have on their thing, you know, um, if you look at their website, that they get back to you within six weeks. And that was about five years ago. I haven't heard from either of them. One of them actually, uh, at the Sunday Times uh, award thing, uh, had drunk as much free wine as I had and everybody else had, and came up to me and said, why didn't you submit to me? Why didn't you send me your work? Why didn't you read it, love? Because it's been sitting in your inbox for years, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so, so I don't know, um, some of it is luck, but it isn't even really just luck. I think it's just um, maybe that, I think I'd probably recommend just um, trying to make the work as good as you can and just keep submitting it because um, people do pick up uh, journals and things. I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know if I know anybody who got an agent by that submission process online. But most of the time, um, it, it's been that, you know, somebody has read their work in a journal or something like that. You know, and certain prizes are brilliant, like the White Review Prize. I think people who get shortlisted for that, they all seem to get publishing deals straight away. You know, there's some prizes that are very prestigious. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm happy to take some questions from the audience at this point, if anyone has any, any questions they'd like to. Uh, yes, Chris. Sorry, they've just did a, a mic on its way here. You sort of half answered the first part of my question, because I was going to say, did you write about 25 and then discard 10? And obviously you did, or somebody. How, do you pick the order they put them in, or are they, are they the, in the order you wrote them? Um, and do you understand the significance of 15 short stories? Okay, so, uh, no. Oh yeah, no, I didn't know that at all. Um, it, actually, they were trying to pull me up to a word count, to be honest. So, 12 stories were submitted to the publisher and then they were like pestering me, like, give us more, give us more, we need to bump up the, the word count a bit. Um, just because short stories, I suppose, are, um, are a hard sell, really, to people, and they were trying to make it a bit easier. So, um, um, and actually, in Bullock um, was one of the stories that was kind of additional, that wasn't with the original submission. So, um, so, okay, so I did get a little bit of advice on how to arrange it, and um, uh, it was from Declan Mead in The Sting and Fly, because he read them, and he said um, to, to do the, um, he said do it the Kevin Barry method, because he published Kevin's two um, collections, the first two collections of short stories, and he said um, it was um, to blow their minds a bit with the first, when you're trying to set the tone. I don't know if this actually is what happened, but anyway. He said, um, so put the first two or three, the ones that you, you're like most proud of, or the strongest ones at the front. Anything that's a bit mad or experimental, put it in the middle, and then try and leave them on a positive note. I mean, I don't know if um, Garland Sunday is a positive note, because terrible things happen, and it's like infanticide and rape and everything. Um, it, it ends on a bit of sex, which is probably a bit positive, but that's it, yeah. Um, yeah. What are you working on at the moment? Uh, I'm trying to write a novel, um, and it's set in, uh, some of it be set in London in the late 80s, early 90s, um, and then some of it in uh, Dublin in the 
probably around 2006, 2007. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's not a Troubles thing. Like one of the characters is Northern, but it's not a Troubles one. Yeah. I, I, I have another one that I do want to write that's a bit Troublesy, but I couldn't face it again. Because mm. it said it gets a bit dark. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, and when you're, just to go back to an earlier question that, that I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with, which is the, the difference between writing a short story and writing a novel. Mm. Is, it, is there a greater intensity in writing a short story? Does, does, does writing a novel permit you kind of greater room for, I'm not going to say error, but... I think you get away with murder in a novel compared with a short yeah. story. There's like nowhere to hide with a short story. Mm -hmm. um, and they are very intense. So when I was trying to write again, I thought I might try and write a short story. And um, I, I tried about three pages of it and thought I was losing my mind. It was just like really full on compared mm -hmm. with the novel. Mm -hmm. um, but then, I don't know, you see, I think it depends on what maybe the approach you take to writing because um, with the short stories, um, um, I would write them really quite slowly. So I'd very rarely like, you know, get a draft out and then go back and redraft and redraft. Um, so I would um, torture myself over the first few pages and then torture myself over the next few. Mm. And, um, but if you did that, I mean, if I had done that with a novel, I'd never have finished it. Mm. So, um, and then also I think maybe writing a novel felt a bit urgent because I thought, I thought it might be dying. So I, um, I thought that instead of like walking around the place, Going, mm. <laughs> write your novel and taking 20 years mm. to do it, I thought I'd better just mm. like write it really quickly yeah. in case I was dying. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've been very open about your, your illness and your, your treatment for, uh, for cancer. Um, how has that realization, that very real sense of mortality, changed your outlook and your, your, your writing? It's been great. It's been great. Um, yeah, I mean, there's nothing like. Um, thinking that you might not have that much time or something to make you not give a shite about things that aren't important. So it's been really brilliant from that point of view. Mm. And it did force me to write the novel. Mm. Like, I think I wouldn't have written it otherwise. Mm. Yeah, mm. so it's been great. Um, and also, um, every day that, um, they sort of complement each other. Like every day that I've had, um, I don't know, um, like sort of, they've had like, they've tried about seven times to find a vein or something to get the immunotherapy into me then um, something nice might happen, you know, might get a nice email or something nice might happen to do with the book. Mm. So it's just made it all really bearable. Mm. It's great. Mm. Yeah. Yes, Janet. Uh, Mike is coming from down here. Thank you. Um, in fact, this is really entertaining and, you know, it wasn't too visceral at all. It was great. Thank you. So, um, I'm a fellow judge on the on the prize, and one thing that struck me, I have six books to read. They're just all a bit grim, you know? Is yeah. there a kind of current, you know, moment in Irish fiction where it is, it is dwelling on the, you know, the kind of drugs that, you know, that, that Frank has talked about, a kind of spiral of, you know, inherited misery that just keeps repeating through the generations? I mean, obviously, because you've described the writing group you were in, um, you've read a lot of other people's work. And, you know, it, I did find it, you know, distinctively, you know, um, Dan beats the wrong word. It's... I'm okay just, with just, Dan beats, though. I'm quite, I don't mind Dan Yeah, no, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to buy them now. And, you know, I'm hoping that you're the antidote to the six that I read. But, you know, it's just, it, it was noticeable that there wasn't a variation in, in theme or, or tempo, mm. really. So, I mean, what do you think about contemporary Irish, you know, fiction? Um, yeah, that's kind of interesting. I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, things in the country have really been a bit mad for the last um, 15 years or so. I think that... Um, I think that the way Irish people behaved when there was credit available is terrifying. And I think um, that they were very much encouraged to borrow a lot of money. And I think that there are sort of post-colonial reasons for a lot of that kind of mad stuff, you know, um, uh, with, with all of the borrowing and everything. And, um, and then I think that what happened afterwards was really incredibly difficult for people. And I think it did indelible things to the landscape as well, which, which is quite difficult to ignore. Uh, you know, there or ghost estates, probably about three of them within walking distance of my house still, and they're just sitting there. There's a housing shortage, but these things are so far gone that they're no, never gonna be any good to anybody. 
and also nobody knows, I mean, that also who owns them is so complex they can't even pull them. And a lot of them were built in really beautiful places. So I think there's that, that, that I would have found very difficult to ignore. And I think that, um, that the last 15 years have been a time of tremendous social change as, as well. Um, you know, with um, marriage equality and, um, and, and finally, um, you know, the Eighth Amendment being uh, repealed. Um, I don't know. I, I, and I think as well that, um, that a, a lot of the secrecy that maybe um, our parents, or even us to a certain extent when we were younger, were, were, were raised with, has, has fallen um, away a bit. And, and it's revealed things that are pretty um, ugly. Um, and um, the country is rife with drugs, like lots of other places. But it, it just maybe is sort of, um, it's, it's sort of hard to position that with the sort of deadly eye, you know, that college view of Ireland, because there is a bit of that, but there's also like, um, I don't know, some kind of decay or something It's a as well. pleasure to think how affronted our many Irish Americans are by the repeal of the eight, you know, because they have the thatch cottage and... Yeah. Uh, so, in all kinds of ways, it looks like one of the most progressive societies in, in Europe, if not the world, in yeah. terms of... Of, of those behaviours, but mm -hmm. but what you're saying is that there are, you know, there are eruptions of old, you know, um, kind of obsessions and ghosts, etc. Yeah, and I think that maybe messing a, with that. Yeah, I think so, and I think that maybe a lot of certainties that people might have had are, are not really there anymore. You know, that and um, it used to be, I suppose, in Irish society that maybe in the 40s and 50s, and this isn't for everybody, but I think that there was maybe a pattern to, you know, people, large families that, you know, the eldest son got the farm, and you know, as you went down through the family, you'd you'd have people kind of scatter it uh, and stuff. And I don't think that emigration is certainly way down, isn't it? And uh, people are sticking around and there isn't maybe that much for them to do in some places. I don't know. I think there's probably a lot of issues that are complicated about class and stuff as well. Um, and yeah, a lot of it is just about a lot of change, I think, or something. Yeah. I mean, I hope it's not totally grim as well. Because I do think, like Nisha Dolan's book, there are some parts where you absolutely roll around laughing a couple of scenes. Do you know what I mean? There are. I think sometimes it's kind of funny too. Yeah. I'll, I'll take one more question here from uh, Sherry. Hi, Louise. Hello. Um, I just want to say, first of all, when I read your book, there were some real laugh out moments that I didn't See? expect. <laughs> and I, I wanted to follow on from that simply because, I mean, one that you read earlier, but there were some that really made me laugh at unexpected moments. But my question today is, you've also written for Radio 4, is it, and mm. RTE? What difference is there in writing for radio and writing novels and short stories? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so, um, I th okay, so I think the writing for radio thing, um, you have to be really careful with dialogue because especially if it's something like a script that you that one person is going to read because that can be really tricky. So if they're like really complex kind of, you know, three or four way conversations, that's not going to work. Um, they like to keep it a bit clean as well. Um, there was something that I wrote and I was told, um, um, well, you can't say tits on Radio Ulster at six o'clock. <laughs> um, so you have to be careful with that sort of thing. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. So I, I think um, it sort of depends on what the brief is. Yeah. Um, and also, interestingly, they always call them scripts. So even if you're asked for a short, like I, I wrote a short story for, um, um, is it short? Short works? Is it short works? I don't know what it's called. And, um, and, um, uh, and they, call, they call it a script. So it, it, it is sort of a little different. And very often they work with you as well, you know, if they're going to um, use it for radio. Uh, there are things that have to be done to kind of change it, which I didn't quite get. But yeah. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Louise, and um, for answering those questions and for reading for us today. The book, um, I, 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 I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I, I like the short story as a form, anyway, and. Um, I think it's, you know, probably the best book of Irish short stories so far in the 21st century, for my money. I think it's a wonderful book, and uh, you'll have the opportunity to uh, buy it afterwards and have Louise sign it. So I just want to thank Louise for a great session, and to you all for coming this morning. Um, I'm pleased that you could join us, and I hope that you enjoyed the session, and Louise will be shortly signing copies of her work downstairs. I also hope that we might welcome you back 
to campus soon to attend one of the many other public events we run throughout the year. If you'd like more information, you can visit our web pages for listings of all future events or to sign up to our events newsletter. But for now, uh, please join me in thanking Louise.